develop the ability to share. And sharing now can become a major part of your life process and life progress. Sharing is a unique human capacity. Everybody has the ability to share. How much you share, of course, is a matter of attitude and the personal conclusions you've come to about your life and what to do about it. But sharing is unique. Here's what's unique about sharing. The more you give, the more you become. It's one of the paradoxes of life. You give away, but you become bigger. It would look like if you would share, you'd become less, but see, that's not true. It's one of those unique life processes. It's like one of those questions you ask, well, you have your first child, you love it dearly. You say, well, if I have another child, do I have to divide my love in half? And the answer is surprisingly no. From somewhere comes this unbelievable capacity to love the other one as much as you did the first one. What if you have three, four, five children? Now, are each one of them going to get less and less and less the capacity of your ability to love and care? And the answer is, strangely, no. As the demand and the opportunity increases, it seems as though your capacity grows. And what you give away seems to multiply. It's one of the mysteries and the uniqueness of life. So sharing makes you bigger. Now here's one of the reasons to share. Share on purpose so that you become bigger, not only for the effect that it will have on other people, but for the effect it will have on you. See, what we want to learn to be is intelligently selfish. The golden rule is a way to be intelligently selfish. The golden rule says, if you want this big flow coming from lots of people, nothing wrong with that. But if you want this big flow coming from lots of people, here's what you must do. Here's the formula. Now that's sort of being intelligently selfish, isn't it? This big flow of awareness and love and, and profit and uniqueness coming from lots of people, that's a bit selfish, but it says, the golden rule says, here's how you get it. It says, what, first three words? Do for others. See, that's how you get this big flow coming your way. And the more you do for more, the bigger the flow. That's called how to be intelligently selfish. The guy says, well, about the best I can do is take care of myself. Well, that's a poor man talking. Always will be poor poor in spirit and poor in money and poor every other way. If you just take care of yourself, you will be limited in every respect. The master teacher said, here's the key to wealth and fortune. He who wishes to be great, the greatest, Muhammad Ali notwithstanding. <laughs> he who wishes to be the greatest, whether it's in wealth or awareness or uniqueness or response or results, Here's the key to wealth, master teacher said. Find a way to become a servant of many. That's the key to greatness. Finding a way to become a servant of many. See, the best way to cure your own bills is to be concerned about other people's bills. The best way to get your own car notes paid is to worry about other people's car notes, not yours. If you worry about yours, it'll be hard to pay. Worry about others, it'll be easy to pay. See, when you get concerned for other people, what can I do to help you and help you and help you and help you? The more people I help, the more return I get, even if it's only a small percentage. People say, well, I'm grateful here. Thanks for helping me here. You just can't believe. One of my friends, went to a, another one of our mutual wealthy friends and said, I've got a project. William, his name was William, said, William, 
If I put this project together and it creates four million dollars for you, will you give me one? If I put this together and it creates for you four million dollars, will you give me one? Guess what he said? Yes. If you put this together and it creates for me four million, I'll be happy to give you one. I'll be satisfied with three. See, that's part of the unique life process. If you help other people, guess what they will do? Share back with you. It's one of those inevitables. Now, once in a while, somebody's mean and greedy and upsets this process, but there's not enough of them to make a difference. Incredible. One of my dear friends now, Wayne Barnes. Wayne is 32 years old. I guess he's about 33 years old now. He's a multimillionaire. He lives in uh, Phoenix. He's a builder, commercial builder. Has this beautiful home on the side of Camelback, Camelback Mountain. Cost 1.3 million. Wayne Barnes attended my seminar 13 years ago in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He was just a young kid, 20 years old, had just gotten married. He and Rosie come to the seminar. Wayne gets all excited, takes all these notes, and he comes up to me after the seminar and says, Mr. Owen, my name is Wayne Barnes. He said, uh, I'll tell you what, he said, I'm excited about all this. He said, I've never heard about this before. He said, I'm going to start setting my goals, changing my life, get my library started. I said, Wayne, nice to meet you. I hope you will. He said, I will. He said, by the way, where's your next seminar? I said, uh, Denver. He said, I'll see you in Denver. Follows me to Denver, to the next <laughs> seminar. He comes this time with his tape recorder, tapes it. That was back before we had the cassette tape program going. And took some more notes. Him and Rosie are there saying, this is really the greatest stuff. And he comes up to me and he says, remember me? I said, yeah, Wayne, I remember you. He said, this is great stuff. He said, I tell you what, he said, I'm going to get rich, change my life. I'm going to help a lot of people. And he's just bubbling and going. He said, where's your next seminar? <laughs> I said, Phoenix. He said, I'll be there. He follows me to Phoenix. Sits there again, takes some more notes, this third seminar. Well, to make a long story short, Wayne Barnes is now a multimillionaire. And uh, he's done extremely well. And he's become one of my very, very dear friends. Wayne probably has one of the finest libraries in the world that I know of especially somebody that age, 33 years old. Uh, he got the book, Think and Grow Rich. He got his journal started. I mean, he did everything, just followed everything. You know, you just once in a while find somebody that just does everything. That's what I did when I met Show. Tell me when to get up. Tell me when to go to bed. Right? Tell me what to do. I mean, my plan hasn't been working. I'm willing to follow yours right to the detail, whatever. And Wayne Barnes was one of those people that just did it all and now he's wealthy uh, when he was building his home uh, just before he had it finished just about finished he took me up on the third floor takes me on a tour through his home and he said uh, Jim he said I can't believe it I've become wealthy he said we've done well haven't we the last 10 12 years I said we sure have Wayne he said uh, I got to thank you for all of this he said by the way I got to show you something he shows me this unique looking room up on the third floor overlooking the city. He said, how do you like the view from here? I said, it's spectacular. He said, how do you like this room? I said, it's fabulous. He said, do you like the way it's furnished? I said, it's unusual. <laughs> he said, uh, well, he said, you might like to know that's your room. He said, whenever you come to Phoenix, now here's where you got to stay. You got to stay with me. He said, uh, I just want to show my gratitude for all the stuff I've learned, now I'm wealthy, and, and I got you now a place in my house, up on the third floor, specially furnished. So see, that's part of the reward of sharing. I got me a room in <laughs> Phoenix, right? I'm telling you, if, you're sh if you'll share, you'll get you a room. And that's not the end of the story. I got, in fact, I just got a card. I wonder if I put it in here somewhere. I just got a card from Wayne Barnes. 
says, Dear Jim, I called you when I was in town in late April. We just sailed from Jamaica to the Bahamas. And next is Nassau. Will you join us soon? Wayne calls me a few months ago to come down to the Balboa Bay Club. And when I get down there, he said, I got to show you something. I said, Wayne, what have you got now? He said, you got to see my ship. <laughs> Unbelievable. He walks me out on this 73-foot sailing schooner. And this is the picture of it right here, called Windhaven. It's a famous 73-foot catch, neat ship. And uh, he said, I've, I've, I've got me a sailing ship. I said, what are you going to do with this thing, right? There's not much water around Phoenix, right? <laughs> no, no, he said. He said, Rosie and I have got the bug about sailing. And he said, we've got us a captain. We've hired us a captain. I said, incredible. So he finds his captain and introduces him to me. Oars was his name, which I thought was a good name for a captain. <laughs> Oars. I said, Wayne, what are you going to do? He said, look, Rosie and I and the two kids, we're going to take off a couple of years and we're going to sail around the world. He said, you talk to me about lifestyle and said, uh, this is just part of our lifestyle. And he said, I want you to join us, do a little sailing with us in the next couple of years. So I promised him I would. So he shows me the ship. And as we go through, he shows me the all the furnishings and everything, right? And then he shows me this room. <laughs> says, how do you like this room? I said, it's fabulous. Do you like what's in it? I said, it's fabulous. He said, that's your room. So I got me a room on a ship. <laughs> how lucky can you get? See, if you will share, no telling what will come back your way if you will share. Be concerned about helping somebody else with their language and help them with their lifestyle and help them with their philosophical conclusions. Help them with learning better the taste of life and the uniqueness of life. Help them with their financial plan. Ask a few questions. Wayne Barnes is one of those people who shares. Wayne gives away the book Think and Grow Rich and As a Man Thinketh. Now that I've got mine, I'm sure He'll probably give mine away. But he buys them by the box. As a man thinketh and think and grow rich. He buys them by the box. And every, every person he meets that he takes a liking to, he says, hey, I got a book for you. And he writes a little note in it and hands it to him. And now there must be thousands of these books circulating around that Wayne Barnes has given away. Part of his way of just sharing, part of his way of passing along um, something that he's come into possession with with that he thought was valuable. But see, that's what can happen to you if you share, if you share. What all of us want to do in consciousness and awareness is become bigger. Okay. This cup will not hold a gallon, why? It's too small. What if you poured a gallon all around this cup? See, it still will only hold this much because it's too small. Now, see, some people are so small in their thinking and their awareness, you could pour happiness all around them. They're not going to get any. <laughs> They're too little in their thinking and their awareness and their acceptance. It doesn't matter how much happiness is available. They're not going to get very much. And you're not going to get very much happiness out of the next experience if you don't grow, if you don't expand. And one of the best ways to expand in your consciousness is by sharing. Touch somebody else's life. Touch somebody else's experience. Give somebody else some information. Right? Pass along a book or a recommendation or, you know, share what you've got. And sure enough, your capacity grows and grows and grows. Now when joy is passed out, you get three times as much as you used to. And somebody wonders, how come you're happier now this year than you were last year? And it's simply because you're growing. You know, happiness is always available, but you can only have what you can hold. Prosperity is always available, but you can only keep what you can hold. So what you want to do is create this capacity, this awareness, this growth experience, so that when joy and happiness and prosperity and unique things are passed out, you get to hold more. Now, you must also understand that you can also hold more sadness. 
But sadness is a life experience. You can hold more disappointment, but disappointment is a life experience. But see, now with the depth of awareness and understanding, you hold it and it becomes not bitter, but it becomes commodity. It becomes experience. It becomes valuable. So that when you talk to the next person that's going through some difficult times, you can reach them with your experience because you've been there. You've tasted it. So we all want to grow in our awareness and taste and capacity. sharing. A major thing to do when this weekend is over is deliberately figure ways to share. Now, there's a lot of things to share. Share your money, share your time, share your knowledge, share your feelings, don't be afraid to share those. That kind of sharing has incredible value. And people who share with us, see what great value that is. My daughters and I are very close. Linda's especially. She calls me just constantly. She was going to take a trip. She said, Daddy, I wanted to call you in case I didn't get to call in the next two or three days. Uh, just to tell you that you happen to be talking to your greatest fan. She says, have you gotten any applause lately? I said, well, I don't know. She says, well, here's some applause. And on the telephone, she's going like this. She said, just remember that when you take your next trip. You have somebody who cares. And remember the applause. And I love you dearly. Just the words and the actions and the sharing and the capacity. See, that's what fills your cup. That's what gives you this incredible uniqueness of living, knowing what it's like to be human in all respects. People who share. Incredible. Then one of the most important things to share is your philosophy. Your perception of life is bound to help somebody. If you show somebody your viewpoint, your vantage point, sure enough, it's going to be revealing to somebody else. You say, well, here's what I've been thinking about life and about activity and about money and about commerce and about lifestyle. Here's what I'm thinking. If you will share that with somebody, Sure enough, somebody's going to come back and say, remember that breakfast we had, the lunch we had, or when we got together that day three or four months ago, and you talked about those things? I've never forgotten that. In fact, I've started to make changes in my life already. You can't believe the feedback you'll get. Because, see, part of the return is not just a room or some money or some percentages. Part of it is the thanks. One of the reasons I do what I do is for the letters and the stories and the people who come back and say, let me tell you what's happening to me. I'm using this stuff and it's changing my life. See, that's heavy. You can't buy that with money. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are. You can only buy it by sharing. You can only earn it, rather, by sharing. And I go for that. I go for the stories. I probably get as much joy out of other people's success as I do my own. The stories you'll come back and share with me or the letters you write or the contact you make and say, here's what's happening to me. I'll be just as excited about that as I will my own success and what's happening to me. I revel in that. I take great joy in it. One of the reasons I do what I do, for that kind of experience of people who say, what you said made a difference for me. See, that's awesome. And guess how many of us can share our ideas? Everybody. You don't have to have a class of 200. You don't have to have a seminar of 1,000. Start with one. That's the way I started, awkwardly, with one. Let me tell you when I gave my first goal seminar. When I was 25 years old, I met Mr. Schof. One morning at breakfast, he asked me, let me see your current list of goals. Remember that story in the evening seminar? So he gave me this little formula on goals. Work on your goals, write them down, you write. Consider the size and what kinds of goals so that they will affect you properly. He gave me this little goal formula that morning at breakfast. Guess when I shared it? 
at lunch. I got a hold of Charlie Garrett. I said, Charlie, let's have lunch. Charlie was a good friend of mine. We had a couple of projects going together. I said, Charlie, I've met this man. Let me tell you what's happening to me. He gave me this little formula for setting goals. I've never heard it before. I'm going to change my whole life. I get together with Charlie and I show him all this. I said, Charlie, write this down, write this down, write this down. <laughs> Let me show you what the man showed me. I said, I'm going to use it to change my life. And why don't we do it together? Let's do it together. You've been a clod just like me, <laughs> right? <laughs> As I recall now, that was my first attack, right? <laughs> I said, hey, we've been poor together. We've been just, you know, knocking around together. I said, now it's time, let's get rich together. Charlie said, wow, that looks interesting. That was really when I first shared it, was the day I heard it, I passed it along. It wasn't a seminar of a thousand people, it was Charlie Garrett. And Charlie was a little startled by my enthusiasm and my excitement, but uh, at least I shared it. So just share, you can't believe what'll happen as far as your life and your lifestyle, if you'll share. Okay. Here's the last subject under personal development. But it's one of the most important. It's called lifestyle. One of the major projects to work on is how to get joy from your substance. Lifestyle is figuring out ways to be unique. And see, uniqueness is that great challenge of taking what you've got and getting pleasure, joy from it. Getting experience from it. See, some people have money, but they don't even know how to spend it. At least they don't know how to spend it for joy. And remember, it's not the amount that counts, it's the plan that counts, it's the thinking that counts. A father wads up a $5 bill, throws it at his son and says, here, take the darn stuff if you need it that bad. <laughs> See, same $5, right? Same $5, only instead of being dispensed with joy, it's dispensed with animosity. Now the father gets no joy from the five dollars by wadding it up and throwing it. See, that's not how you get joy from it. It's the same money, but it depends on how you spend it. It depends on how you give it. And how you give it is called lifestyle. And Shof taught me lifestyle in the simplest little way. Shof taught me how to be a two-quarter person. So I didn't understand what that meant. He said, well, let's say you're getting your shoe shined. And the shoe shine boy's done a great job. And he's whistled and talked and kept you entertained. And you look down, you got one of the world's great shines. So you reach in your pocket and you pay him. Now, after you've paid him, you reach in your pocket and get a handful of change. And the thought occurs to you, shall I give him one quarter or two quarters for a tip for my fabulous shine? Shof said, here's lifestyle. If two amounts pop in your mind for giving, like one quarter or two quarters, Shof said, always go for the higher amount. He said, become a two-quarter person. I said, well, what difference would that make? He said, all the difference in the world, being a one-quarter person versus a two-quarter person. Now, you got one quarter or two quarters, so it's not the amount that's going to be the problem. The problem is how you spend it. See, that was unique. He said, if you're thinking two quarters, look at my shine, I better go for two quarters. And they say, well, no, I'll just give him one. He said, that will affect you the rest of the day. It'll bother you. Sure enough, right in the middle of the day, you'll look down, see your shine, and say, I got to be cheap. One lousy quarter. <laughs> he said, it'll affect you. But he said, if you go for the two quarters, he said, that'll affect you the rest of the day. You'll be happier. Shof said, you cannot believe the good feelings you can buy for just a quarter. See, I didn't understand that. 
Then I learn it's not the amount, it's the thought, it's the idea. Become a two-quarter person. Shove taught me what the word tip meant. See, I didn't understand. I'm from farm country, Idaho. What do I know about tip, right? He says, do you know what tip means? T-I-P. Comes from a phrase. What is it? To ensure promptness. Shove said tip means to ensure promptness. Now, he said, if that's true, if tip is to ensure promptness, when should you give it? Up front. See, I didn't know that. He said, sophisticated people always ensure good service. They don't take a chance. I thought, wow, what a way to live. I always thought, well, you waited till the meal was over, see whether or not you got good service, and then tip. He said, no, 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 not sophisticated people. You don't wait and see. You ensure. I thought, wow. Makes all the difference in the world, right? You're taking a couple of people to lunch, right? And you calculate, let's see, the tip will be about so much, right? You call Mary over and say, Mary, right? Arm around the shoulder, Mary, here's $10. Would you take good care of me and my friends? You won't believe the <laughs> service. They do what's known as hover. I mean, they hover <laughs> right around your table. Otherwise, you can never find them. I mean, where's my waitress? Where's my waitress? All the difference in the world. Same money, see, but it's called giving it up front instead of behind. Now, it doesn't mean you can do it every time, but it means you just think, 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 think of ways to be unique. Think of ways, right? It works wonders. I took a neat lady, oh, this has been a couple of years ago. We went to the Beverly Hilton Hotel to the uh, Trader Vic's restaurant close by where I used to live. And... Uh, we're all excited right? about going to Trader Vic's, Beverly Hills, nice place for, to entertain. And uh, when we get there, we drive up in front of Trader Vic's and two attendants come out. <whistles> one opens one door, one opens the other door. And they let out my lady friend. The other gentleman lets me out, says, Mr. Roan, nice to have you here. And uh, my lady's already impressed. He said, have a good meal. I said, we certainly will. So we leave, right, go into the restaurant, have this fabulous meal. When we come out of Trader Vic's, as we walk out the door, there is my car sitting right there. Both doors are open, and the motor is running. <laughs> My lady can't believe it. She said, I've never seen service like this. I said, hey, this is really great. <laughs> so one attendant lets my lady friend in, right? On the other side, another one lets me in. They close the doors. Says, Mr. Owen, it's been nice to have you here. Have a nice evening. I say, thank you very much. And I drive away. When we get to about the first light, down on uh, Wilshire Boulevard. My lady friend looks over at me. She says, Jim, hold it just a minute. I said, what is it? She said, I just thought of something. I said, what's that? She said, you forgot to, to tip them at Trader Vic's. After all that service, you didn't give them any money. I said, hey, look, it'll be okay. She said, oh, no, 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 we got to go back. <laughs> we got to go back, go back. I said, hey, take my word for it. It's okay, it's okay. She said, no, 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 we got to go back. I mean, we're not going any further. You got to, for that kind of service, you got to tip the money. And then I had to tell her <laughs> that I made my first trip to Trader Vic's that morning. <laughs> Lifestyle. 
Somebody once said, money takes no right out of the English language. <laughs> if money is no problem, would you? Yes. <laughs> you don't even have to go any further. But it doesn't take that much. You don't really have to be wealthy. All you have to be is smart. Smart, intelligence. Intellect is the measure of value. It is said the saints lived simply, not because they were holier, but because they were smarter. Could be they were wiser. The simple things of life can many times be the most valuable. Lifestyle, learning how to spend your money, learning what to do with it, anticipating versus waiting till the last minute. It's called lifestyle. A man in Detroit, Michigan, came to the seminar many years ago. Decided he was going to change his whole life. He said, Mr. Owen, I, I got some major changes to make. And he said, you're going to be happy with my progress. I said, I don't doubt that. And sure enough, when I came back, a few months later, he already told me some neat stories. He said, one is, I've just been living this narrow life. He said, I've got two teenage daughters. And he said, uh, it just hasn't been going that well. And he said, I can now see some of the major problems. And he said, I've been causing them. He said, let me tell you one little story. He said, my daughters like to go to the, some of the rock and roll concerts, right? And he said, sure enough, when it comes time for one of these big concerts to come to town, you know, my daughters come and they beg and they do all kinds of things to try, you know, finally get a couple of dollars out of me so they can go attend the concert. And he said, I am give them all these lectures and reluctantly, finally, I part with my money and say, well, okay, if you insist, here's the money, but I hope there's not another one in a long time. He said, that, he said that's the way I operated, reluctantly. He said, most of the time, I even made him beg. And he said, now I can see that's not the way to live. And then he told me the story. After he decided to change his life and change his whole lifestyle and his procedure, he said, I'm going through the paper one day and I found out one of the rock concerts is coming to town and it's one of the, my girl's favorite rock stars coming to town. So he said, now with my new life in view, he said, I go down and buy the ticket. And he said, I brought him home. When they got home from school that day, he said, I handed him an envelope and said, here are your tickets to the next concert. He said, the begging days are over. He said, my daughters couldn't believe <laughs> what had happened. He said they were so happy, terribly excited. So he gives them the envelope. Now he says, don't open the envelope until the evening of the concert when you get there. They said, okay. So comes the evening of the concert and his two daughters rush off to the concert. When they get there, they hand the usher the envelope. They open it up, right? And inside, they take out the tickets and the usher says, follow me takes them down front, 10th row, center. They can't believe. They say, hey, wait a minute, hold it, hold it. Let's take a look at those tickets again. <laughs> this can't be. He looks at the ticket and says, yes, it is. Just follow me. 10th row, center. See, before then, all the tickets they begged for were way back up in the balcony right where you couldn't see. They couldn't believe it, 10th row, center. He said, uh, that night, a little late, just to see what would happen. He said, sure enough, the concert's over. Girls come home about midnight, bursting through the door. One lands in his lap. One's got her arms around his neck. They say, you have got to be probably the greatest father who ever lived. And he said, guess what those tickets cost me? Eight dollars. Eight dollars. You can't believe how for such small amounts you can change your whole life by changing your attitude, your procedure, 
your lifestyle, anticipating versus being reluctant, figuring out ways to do it with joy instead of animosity. Lifestyle. If there's one thing to start working on in a heavy way after you leave here this weekend, is figuring ways, figuring ways to be unique. Remember, it's not the amount that counts. It's the plan that counts. Lifestyle, learning how to live. See, once you've put this all together, you will anticipate every day. You can't wait for the morning to come. You can't wait to get started. You can't wait to get at it. You can't wait to put your plan into action. You can't wait for all the little surprises you've got ready for some people. You can't wait to execute lifestyle and be more productive and progressive and learn and grow. And of all of the things we've covered here in these two days, this is one of the things that can affect your life so much that now it will be an investment in your progress. It'll be an investment in your language. You can't believe what it'll do in getting you a promotion on the job. All things will reflect what you do concerning how you live, lifestyle, and what you do about your family and yourself and your money and your substance and your time and your talent and your ability. Don't just live your life. Design it. Don't just exist. Grow. Change. Develop. Become unique. And it'll add a whole new dimension to your life. It's called lifestyle, part of personal development time and considered to be America's foremost business philosopher. He has been sharing his success philosophies for over 40 years to over 4 million people worldwide. Jim Rohn has helped motivate and train an entire generation of personal development trainers as well as hundreds of executives from America's top corporations. He is a master motivator, author, and a living legend. Welcome, Jim. Wow, Chris, thank you very much. Yeah, I good to have that. you here. I'll take you with me around the world. Inter <laughs> just introduce me. Yeah. So I want to ask you, you know, we, <laughs> we were talking as we did the run-through for the promo there uh, about being a living legend, and you really are. I mean, you have had uh, an incredible life, an exceptional life, where you've been able to influence so many people. How do you go from the kid that you started out to, you know, where you're at now, speaking all over the world? How do you get started in that? Well, part of it is uh, living long enough to have a chance to be a legend, right? There you go. And I just celebrated birthday number 75. Uh -huh. But uh, 25 years old, I'm living in uh, uh, Idaho, where I was born and raised. And, um, you know, I'm married. I've got a little family started and struggling to pay my bills. But, you know, working hard and doing the best I can. And uh, then you've heard the story. This, I get this knock on the door, and um, there's a little Girl Scout selling Girl Scout cookies. Huh. And she gives me this incredible presentation. Uh, Girl Scouts, best organization in the world. Everybody wants to support the Girl Scouts. We've got these cookies, only $2. And she very politely asked me to buy. No problem. I wanted to buy. Big problem. I didn't have $2 in my pocket. You know, and I'm not destitute, but my pockets are empty. I'm a grown man. I'm 25 years old. I've been to one year of college. I got a little family going. I live in America, and I don't have the $2 in my pocket. And I didn't want to tell her that, so I did what I thought was next best. I lied to her. And I said, hey, look, I've already bought lots of Girl Scout cookies. We've still got plenty in the house we haven't eaten yet. She said, oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. And she leaves. When she leaves, I say to myself, I don't want to live like this anymore. I mean, how low can you get lying to a Girl Scout right exactly. now? Exactly. So that was one of those days I call the day that turns your life around. Yeah. When I really made the commitment, I must start a search for finding ways to, to do better. I always wanted to, but I just hadn't found the person or the ways. Yeah. Shortly after that, I found someone who became my mentor over a five-year period after that, between ages 25 and, uh, and 30, 31. Um, what he taught me made me a millionaire, um, entrepreneur, changed my life, refined my philosophy, helped me develop skills and disciplines that I didn't have before. Mm -hmm. Totally 
revolutionized my life over that five-year period. And uh, that was the beginning of uh, my change of uh, mind and, and circumstances. And uh, then that led to uh, where I am today. I wonder how many people have that dramatic moment like you did. You shut that door and you went, I just lied to a Girl yeah. Scout person. Some people could have just said, well, yeah. I had to do what I had to do. Yeah. Other people like yourself say, never again. Yeah, you don't know. I call it the mystery and the magic. Mm -hmm. Why one experience affects a person one way and another person passes it off yeah. and doesn't let it, doesn't let it uh, change their life for the better. Or they might not do it now and maybe later something else will happen and that, that'll be the moment. You just don't know. As you know, lecturing, giving seminars, teaching, training, you know, why some people pick it up, do something with it, change their lives and others don't. I remember at the 2004 weekend leadership event, we had someone come back who had been to the 2001 mm -hmm. and they were in real estate and they had bought some outrageous amount of real estate, you know, $50 million in the last, because they walked out of the last one and said, mm. and then another guy was there and he said, I was at the same one, but he went out and did it and I didn't. Well, he was back for 2004, he said, yeah. in 2007, he right. said, I'm coming back and I will have built my fortune. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's part of the mystery. You know, I've written how many books now, five or six, and uh, um, I should have written <clears throat> 26. <laughs> so what happened to those other 20 books? That's the mystery. Mm. You know, the magic is the six and the mystery is the 20 that are missing. Mm. So we're a bit of a mystery to ourselves, right? Yeah, sure. I should have, but I didn't. Yeah. You know, I had the skills, but I didn't put them to work. Uh, so we all have a bit of that. But then the things we do that sort of dramatically change our life, that's the magic. That's the, that's the power. Yeah. Part of it is the law of averages. You know, I tell this little Bible story about the sower went out to sow the seed, and he was highly ambitious, and he had good seed, but the first part of the seed that he sowed, the birds got. And then the next, uh, he keeps going, and the next seed falls on uh, thorn, uh, stony ground mm -hmm. where the soil is shallow. And the little plant starts to grow in the first hot day. It, it withers and dies. So he keeps on going. The next seed that he sowed f uh, fell on thorny ground. Yeah. The little plant starts to grow, and then the thorns choke it to death. And it called the thorns little cares, little things that keep people from doing mm -hmm. the bigger things. And then finally, he keeps on sowing, and the seed falls finally on good ground. But then the good ground was a bit of a an interesting idea that some of it produced 30%, some of it produced 60, and some of it produced 100. So it's the full range from the birds getting some and the hot weather yeah. and the thorns to the good ground, even though good ground has a variety of 30, 60, 100. So when I started out lecturing, I wondered why I couldn't get everybody to do the 100%. Then I found out, you know, this, this is not to be, right. you know. So that when I say to John, you should have been at the meeting last night, and he said, well, hey, the screen, screen door came off the hinges. I had to fix and do some repairs. And so I say, now I understand yeah. that so some people are going to let little things cheat them out of doing better things. But maybe that'll change. Yeah. You know, a, a week from now, somebody wakes up and has an experience like I did with the, with the Girl Scout, and, uh, and everything changes. Mm -hmm. So the door usually is always open unless somebody totally resists the idea of self-improvement. But I think there's enough experiences along the way to prod us and push us a little bit. Or we hear a testimonial or we read a book right. or somebody buys us a ticket and we go to a seminar and we're never the same again. You share an idea with someone, two people, one of them says, I see it, and the other one says, it isn't clear to me. You say, why not? It's perfectly clear when you shared it. Yeah, why can't you see what I see? Yeah, true. We all, how come you don't feel like I feel? So you have to allow for that. <clears throat> and then we have to allow for it happening even in our own experience, like me with the missing books. Uh, I should have and I didn't. I let it go and I should have picked it up. Um, so I th guess the key is to do the best we can. And the key is to keep learning from every experience possible our own personal experiences or from someone else's experiences by sermon, yep. the lyrics of a song, uh, a personal testimonial someone gives you sitting at Denny's for a Tuesday morning breakfast and something clicks and something happens. You never know.
Yeah, those moments are kind of a mm. mixture of everything coming together, yeah. right timing and your own yeah. personal circumstances. So you end up going to work for Earl Shelf, and you had lots of lessons to learn. What Over were some that of those? six-year, seven-year period, I was with, he was with me about five years, then he died but at the early age of 49. Huh. But uh, those were such dramatic days of incredible change. And the stuff he taught, he only went to the ninth grade in school, so mm. he put things very simply. For the excuses I gave, he said, no, those are not the reasons. I said, things cost too much. He said, no, you can't afford them. You know, little philosophies like that that opened my eyes to see. What was the story where you brought him a paycheck? You said, this is all they pay. Yeah, this is I all love, they pay. He I love said, this. no, this is all they pay you. I thought, <laughs> oh, you're right, I guess. Mm -hmm. He said, don't some at the company make three, four, five times as much? And I said, well, yes. And he said, well, this is not all they pay. This is all they pay you. Yeah. If you qualified for the ten times this... Wouldn't they pay you that amount? And I said, I guess they would, of mm. course. He said, well, let's go to work on that. Yeah. We don't have to go to work on the company for more pay. We've got to go to work on you to become more qualified. Yeah, they, they have pay structure already set up yeah, for some people. Yeah, already set up. You've got to fit into that. And um, then when I, in my <laughs> lectures, I show the, this little economic uh, staircase, you know, ladder to climb. Yeah. Starts at $5 an hour and goes all the way up to $32 million for one year. Right. One year's annual income. And... Uh, Somewhere along the way, uh, by what we hear and what we experience, we try to make ourselves better qualified for the next move up. Yeah. And that's the key, is to keep moving up, keep growing, keep developing, see what all you can do with your life. What uh, he, he was really the first person to, to give you the idea of personal development, mm -hmm. right? What kinds of things was he telling you about the importance of developing yourself? What were some of those lessons that he taught you? One he used, which got really got my attention, he said, uh, why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? I'm 25 years old. He said, this is America, land of opportunity. Why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? And then he said, for what it will make of you to achieve it. Hmm. And I thought, wow, that's a whole different philosophy. Set a goal to become a millionaire for what for the person you have to become in order to be worth a uh, million dollars. Then he said, once you've become a millionaire, you can give the money away because what's important is not what you got, but the person you became. Mm. And I got the message. Mm. And that's where I started hearing those phrases from him. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Um, bringing value to the marketplace is how you get paid. Yeah. The more value you bring to the marketplace, the better your pay, and also you get paid for what you become, mm. a leader, an entrepreneur, a manager, somebody who has the ability to inspire other people. Uh, so somebody's watching and they're saying, okay, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Mm. And they, they're, they're, they agree with it in principle. They say, yeah, that sounds right. I know I need to work on myself. What, did, what would you recommend people do? I started out with developing a list of skills I didn't have. Huh. You know, I'm raised in farm country, southwest Idaho. Huh? Right. I know how to milk cows, but the pay's not good. <laughs> That's right. So the first thing, and I started part-time, um, a little uh, sales adventure on how to get customers. It was in health and nutrition, and uh, I believed in the product, and I was taught, here's how you get a customer. And then here's how you ask them, who do they know that wants to be healthier? Um, then um, expand your business from there. So that was the first extra skill I learned from just the regular farm skills that started to change my life. Mm. So this is part of the personal development, learning that extra skill. In my seminars, I now teach in the 21st century, you need more than one skill. One is for economic safety. Right. Here's the guys that, that's worked for General Motors. They just, what, closed a couple of plants and laid off, what, I don't know, 25,000 people. This guy has been there, let's say, for 15 years. Now he's laid off, and he tells us he's already having economic difficulty. Mm. And the reason is, Chris, he only had one skill. Mm. You know, over the last three or four years, if he would have taken accounting two nights a week or something, yeah, so that when this crisis occurred, he would have something to fall back on. Mm. So in my seminars, I teach a whole list of skills I learned uh, by the time I was... Uh, 3031 that not only made me rich but uh, really broadened the whole scope of my ability to be an entrepreneur, affect other people's lives, 
And then I got into, of course, teaching and training. But uh, that's part of it. Mm. I learned sales. I learned to find good people. I learned uh, to get people to work together. Interesting phrase in the Bible says, if two or three agree on a common purpose, nothing's impossible. I thought, wow, two or three, not all alone, but two or three. So if you can get inspired and inspire a couple of people to go with you, you could do some pretty extraordinary things. I learned how to do that. Mm. Then I learned uh, recognition and reward, rewarding people for steps of progress. You may work for a company and they reward people for the big steps. I've learned to reward people for little small steps of progress. Anything you can think of yeah. to give them a, a reward for making uh, some progress. It doesn't have to be a big reward. It doesn't have to be big. Small, Something small. Kind word. Then it uh, comes to a philosophy that says, be so busy giving other people recognition, you really don't need it for yourself. Yeah. Now you've arrived at a very good place. Yeah. Your greatest happiness is other people getting rewards, not necessarily yourself. Hmm. But then Zig comes back with the old philosophy that's so true. If you help enough people get what they want from either money to recognition or success, uh, you can have everything you want. Yeah. I heard Zig say that I think almost 50 years ago, 45 plus. And uh, when he said you can have everything you want, I underlined the word everything. <laughs> Because you could want a lot, And I right? said, hey, I think Zig is right. If you help enough people, get what they want. Yeah. But that's another skill. Mm -hmm. Then I think the ultimate skill is the skill of communication. And I divided that one into three parts. One is training, right? Showing somebody how to do the job. Next is teaching. And I simply used the two words for uh, a purpose, teaching life skills. Because one of the things that helped me really revolutionize my life, age 25, was learning how to set goals. Mm. Decide what you want, write it down, start checking them off. Where do you want to go? Make that list. Yeah. What do you want for your family? Make that list. Yeah. I started doing all that. That's called teaching, teaching life skills. So if you combine job skills with life skills, your chances now really start to multiply. Mm. Then the ultimate in communication is learning to inspire helping somebody to see themselves better than they are, um, transporting them into the future. Say, Mary, here's who you could become. With just a few changes, I promise you, you'll never be the same again. Here's the kind of person you could become. Confident, strong, able to cope with circumstances and changes. You could be that person. So do you think that, that that is something that anybody can do? I mean, when typically when people think of leaders, they think of the heads of, you know, captains of industry and presidents and, you know, leaders of social movements. Is that something, somebody do middle management in their own sure. career, parents? Sure. Parents should even learn to do it at yeah. home. Yeah. Here's the person you could become. Um, we try every means possible, right, especially for our children, yeah. to expose them ideas that we know we translate best we can, or from church or hopefully from school, um, from the neighborhood, from uh, the business community where they might get a job and go to work. We just hope and pray that they will be constantly exposed to things that will cause them to think, change, refine habits, uh, develop skills, uh, have personal satisfaction of the success they want. Mm -hmm. We hope that happens. But it's going to come from a variety of sources, not just one. It's like mentoring. Uh, I happened to find somebody who, you know, was the business employer, uh, business partner that I worked with, um, as well as being a, a mentor. But sometimes, it, you know, somebody mentors you in good health. Somebody else mentors you in spiritual matters. Someone else mentors you in uh, family relations. And someone else mentors you in business and uh, developing skills. Did you go looking, actively looking for mentors throughout your life? Uh, no. After that Girl Scout experience, um, I said to myself, I must find something. And sure enough, a friend of mine said, I've gone to work with this man. You've got to meet him. <laughs> that was shortly after that I met Mr. Shelf. And it's Who knows the mystery of, of that, right? You, yeah. Um, when you when really, the student is ready, the yeah. teacher appears. Yeah. When you have that determination... Seems like things start, you know, happening and coming your way. Yeah. At least the odds are better. Yeah. 
everything is a matter of odds. But if you do certain things, I think you can increase your odds that better things will happen mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. So after you became successful in your business, then uh, there was a phone call. You got a phone call, right? And somebody said, hey, come and talk it to us. Yeah, I and moved to Beverly Hills. Because that's what you should do when you become successful. Yeah, right? where else would a Hills. kid from the farm country of Idaho <laughs> move to if you got rich? Beverly Hills. <laughs> so yeah. when I get there, a friend of mine said, you've got to come and tell your story to my service club. You belong to the Rotary. And he said, if I arrange this uh, breakfast meeting, I think our luncheon meeting, he said, uh, would you come, you know, just do a little 30-minute talk and tell your story? And he said, we'll call it uh, Idaho Farm Boy Makes It to Beverly Hills. I said, okay, suits me. So I did this little talk, and uh, evidently they enjoyed it. Before the day was over, I got a couple more invitations. You got to come talk to our service club, tell that same story, share those same ideas. That started me thinking about, um, you know, really becoming involved in teaching and training. I'd done a lot of training yeah. and inspiring in my own <clears throat> entrepreneurial organizations, but uh, not not for the public. So I started doing these little talks for service clubs and once in a while a high school class, college class, enjoying it very much. Then one day a man said to me, uh, I've heard your talk now two or three times and I've got this little company going. And he said, if you would come make a presentation, I'd be happy to pay you. And I thought, incredible. There's a job. Yeah. <laughs> Could I really share my story and get paid? He said, I'll be happy to do it. Wow. So I did that. Then that led to another one and another one. Then later on, the idea occurred, why not have uh, some representatives out uh, selling tickets to come and hear a public seminar? Yeah. And uh, we finally put that together. And that was, you know, all those many, many years ago. Tell us a little bit about that. This is a kind of a peek behind the scenes of, because you're really one of the pioneers, you and Zig and some of the other folks, Cabot Roberts and, and some of those. What was the, what was the culture like back then when, when you guys were out barnstorming America and really uh, developing the whole personal development culture that now is so prominent in America? What was that like? It was exciting. Uh, of course, mine, I gave it all away. You know, all of those speeches I did yeah. in colleges, the high schools, and for service clubs and so on, that was all free. Then when somebody offered to pay me, that put a whole new look on it. And then uh, began this process mm -hmm. of uh, creating something valuable enough to where someone would buy a ticket and go and listen. Mm -hmm. And uh, those were exciting days. The first one I did for pay, I think I had about 45 or 50 participants that bought tickets, a lot of them were friends of mine that I'm sure bought because they were friends of mine, but there were some others that, you know, legitimately bought at the Beverly Hilton Hotel in Beverly Hills and that first public seminar for people buying tickets, I think was 1961 or 62, wow. 1962. Wow. And then that started, it started growing from there. Yeah and uh, developed to uh, where I am now, traveling the world and telling my story and still sharing ideas. Yeah. But uh, it was it was a fantastic time. What Earl you, Nightingale, right? Yeah, some right, of those way Earl. back in the beginning. Napoleon Hill with his lecture series way back before was probably one of the first. They started calling it self-help movement. Yeah. And uh, then came along the phrase uh, personal development, show talked about personal development. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job, he yeah. said. Yeah. If you work hard on your job, you can make a living, which is fine. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune, which is super fine. I thought, this is good philosophy. Yeah. So did you guys uh, ever get together and do uh, big events with you, know, you and Zig and uh, Norman Vincent Peale. Yeah, he was finally, around. over the years. American Sales Masters, some of All those. All of that, way back. That yeah. goes way back. Huh. Yeah. I remember the first time I did a multi-speaker. I think it was in St. Louis. It was about, uh, I don't know, nine, ten thousand people there in one of the big auditoriums. Zig was there and I was there. Norman Vincent Peale was there. A couple of others. And uh, this is the time when Zig said to me, he said, Jim Rohn said, you got to pay attention and you've got to really be good today in your presentation. 
because he said if 10,000 people turn on you, it is going to be a difficult day. <laughs> <laughs> Words of wisdom. Intimidated me. So I get up to speak and I'm looking up in the balconies, you know, and I'm uh, saying I got to do my best. Zig may be right. If I don't do well, uh-huh. you know, I will incur the wrath of uh, these 10,000 people. But that was, uh, that, that was good advice. Mm. I learned along the way to pay more attention to the audience. Way back in the early days, I was more absorbed in my lecture and what I was having to say. You know, people could have left and I probably wouldn't have really known it. Mm -hmm. But then I got to where I could look up and, you know, find out what's going on out in the audience. Are they getting it? And is it coming across? And Mm -hmm. I teach that now in some of my seminars. Yeah. When you think back to those speakers, who really stands out in your mind as, as being somebody that you really admired and respected yeah zig ziglar was you know we've traveled gone to other countries uh, to lecture uh on the same venue um earl nightingale was a was unique you know a unique person in his own his own right the stuff that he wrote as well as his uh, speeches and lectures uh were captivating uh interesting made you listen thought-provoking and that's all we're really trying to do, right? Yeah. The minister on Sunday morning, right, just wants to share ideas, get people thinking, pondering about their life, how to refine things spiritually as well as how to refine things uh, economically and personally. Yeah. Uh, and we can all use a little coaching, whether it's one-on-one person or whether it's in a seminar setting or whether it's church or a Sunday school class, or wherever it is, or ideas are being shared. There's always a chance to... Uh, pick up something that you hadn't quite thought about before. Hey, it's Chris Wagner, and I hope that you're really enjoying this interview that I did with Jim. Uh, you can tell that it was a little while ago. You can see how young I looked in that video. It was such an amazing opportunity uh, to be able to work with Jim Rohn, but then uh, to be able to interview him, which we didn't know at the time, this would become the last video interview that Jim ever did. So I hope that you're enjoying it. Uh, some uh, Some wisdom from one of the great legends. And um, I've got some amazing resources for entrepreneurs uh, that are available to you. All you have to do is just go down and check in the the comments and the links below, and uh, you'll be able to see some other great resources. So let's get back to uh, listening to the great wisdom of the legendary Jim Rohn. In 2004, summer of 2004, um, you got the Masters of Influence Award at the National Speakers Association. Mm. Mm. And I was there to be able to to be there and see that. And one of the things that really amazed me was they asked the crowd, and there was maybe 2,000 people there, two, 3,000 people there, um, how many of you would say that Jim Rohn has significantly influenced your life or your speaking career? And nearly two-thirds of the hands went up. How do you feel about that? It's, you know, it's, it's so extraordinary from where I came from. Yeah. Southwest Idaho farm country. I still have the old family farm overlooking the Snake River where I make a little wine and, uh, you know, grow a few crops and live the good life there. But it is extraordinary. Um, One of the greatest experiences, and you heard me say before, is when someone puts your name in in their testimonial. Uh, Here's the person that found me. Here's the person that got me started. Here's the person that wouldn't let me quit. Gave me more reasons for staying than for leaving. Uh, here's the person who believed in me until I could believe in myself. And then they mention your name. Yeah. That's big time stuff. Yeah. You can't buy it with money. Yeah. You have to earn it. What's extraordinary for me now is to go to Russia and lecture. Uh, I started lecturing in Russia 12 years ago. To go back now again and have someone say 12 years ago, here's what's happened to me, my family. I want to introduce you to some people. I've helped change their life since you changed my life. That's so extraordinary. I guess that's why at age 75, I'm still off to uh, Chile and Santiago and a few days after that, Australia, then uh, three cities, I think, in India and uh, South Korea. One little trip. Yeah. I want to talk to you about your travels. And it's one of the fun things about having speakers like yourself who come in who do world travel. And to really just ask them, what what's the world like? You know, there's a lot of people who are watching the show who they don't get a chance to travel that yeah. much, you know. And we hear things in the American media or whatever. But what are some of the countries that you've loved to spend time in? And what do you think the average person should know about some of these countries and cultures? Mm. 
Uh, speaking of the travel, you know, I used to travel to Concord oh, before they shut it all yeah. down. Three hours from London to New York. It's so extraordinary. Now Singapore's got this new flight, Los Angeles to Singapore Direct, uh, 17 and a half hours. Oh. So that's quite an experience. Yeah. You know, it's like nine meals and four movies and uh, <laughs> finally you get there. Yeah. But uh, first class is, you know, exciting and caviar and champagne and, you know, all the amenities. But um, traveling to other countries, it, you know, people are basically the same. You know, they've got families and they want to do well and they want the next generation to be better off than, than, than they are. Um, people have hopes and dreams, want to know how they can achieve uh, success. What could I do? It seems like I've been stuck for four or five years. What could I do to make a difference? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to know. And then they want to be fulfilled. People want to, you know, have satisfaction, <clears throat> whether it's uh, spiritually, socially, personally. Satisfaction of uh, personal development. I'm better than I used to be. Mm -hmm. And I think if I keep working hard, I stand an excellent chance of being better in the future than I've been in the past. Uh, those kind of aspirations, no matter where I go, from South Africa to Scandinavia, from Korea to India to um, Vladivostok, Russia, um, doesn't matter. People are basically the same, have the same desires. Uh, some of the forms of government are a bit different, yeah. but uh, not the aspirations of the people. Do you take particular joy going to countries where there's burgeoning capitalistic societies? Yeah. Yeah. What what's do you been, see, what's what do you been see fun for me is, uh, is uh, the opportunity to teach capitalism in uh, Russia over yeah. the last 12 years. Yeah. I've been there like five times in all the major cities because they didn't have any concept of capitalism all those years under communism. Right. Because communism taught capital belongs to the state, not the people. And of course, we believe capital belongs to the people, not the state. A total different economic philosophy. But now, since the walls came tumbling down in uh, Germany, what, 14, 15 years ago, now they have the opportunity to become entrepreneurs, and capitalism, personal responsibility, instead of uh, we're always relying on the state. Uh, so it's all changing. And they're hungry, aren't they? Just, you know, they're ready for it. Yeah. And uh, of course, the, the same mystery and magic occurs in Russia like sure. it does everywhere yeah. else. And yeah. He tell you, here's how you can dramatically change your life from pennies to fortune. And uh, some say, yes, that's great. I will. And some say, I'm not sure that's for me. And I have to learn to accept that. Right. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about kids because you have a mm -hmm. lot of uh, a lot of thoughts and theories about things that kids should learn, lessons they should learn. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about some One of those. One of the easiest is capitalism because I use it even in Russia teaching capitalism that uh, even kids can, you know, become capitalists yeah. because all it involves is um, here's a 12-year-old. Couldn't he search the neighborhood? doesn't have to be 12, seven or eight. Eight years old, let's say, this little kid, and he searches the neighborhood, finds a little broken wagon and pays a dollar for it and brings it home, fixes it up, paints it until it shines, straighten out the wheels until they're true, takes it back to the neighborhood and sells it for $5. Makes a $4 profit. Could that be possible? And everybody says, well, yes, it could be possible. And all he would do have to have is the idea. So I'm teaching kids how to have two bicycles, one to ride and one to rent. Yeah. Right. You don't have to be General Motors to make a profit. Yeah. So just a bit of ingenuity, you know, from the lemonade stand or whatever. Those are just all examples of, uh, of capitalism at work yeah. where you make something and sell it or you buy something and sell it. Um, then teaching kids a little bit about money management, yeah. I think, is important. What are don't, the things that they ought to learn? Don't spend more than 70 cents out of every dollar. And then 10 cents for charity or church, another 10 cents for active capital, like find a broken wagon, pay a dollar for it, fix it, sell it for five. Uh, that's active capital. And then last 10% is a passive capital. Let someone else use your money. Huh. In 
invest it and let them pay you interest or whatever. So a good good program for kids to learn. 70, 10, 10, and 10. Yeah. And if you do that over a reasonable period of time, you'll become financially independent. Isn't it funny how human nature, even at that little kid level, is to spend it all? Yeah. And then some more. Yeah. Then borrow and spend some more. So the way you teach it is, could a child buy a bottle of soap for $2 and sell it for 3 The answer is yes. He goes, Johnny goes next door and says, Mrs. Brown, Mama uses this soap. It's really good. It's only $3. And Mrs. Brown says, Johnny, I've really got plenty of soap. And he says, you better let me come in and check. <laughs> Kids don't have to go to class, <laughs> right? right? They, <laughs> they don't take no for no, an answer. Yeah. About $40,000 a year, not to own it, but to watch it. And I said, that's too much to pay. Right. <laughs> I'll pay maybe 4000 but not 4000 Right. Come on. <laughs> pay the 4000 and yeah. throw it away and don't use Absolutely. it. You'll still be ahead of the game. So it sometimes all it takes is a revolutionary idea like that. Somebody yeah. says, I think Jim Rohn's right. This television is costing me too much money to watch it. Because mm -hmm. if I would use that same time employing myself, finding ways to make a profit, whatever, no telling what would happen. Yeah. What about? But it? unless somebody comes along, and sort of you know shakes up the basket and talks about things like that, uh, on our own we could think about it eventually. But uh, sometimes it's you know it's a bit late. Yeah. Because that's why when Shof, I said things cost too much, and he said no, you can't afford them. I hadn't thought about that before. You know, when I said this is all the company pays, he says no, that's all they pay you. And without that kind of sort of counsel or guidance or reminder, it's easy to drift along a few more years without making the necessary changes to make your life better. And he was pointing the responsibility back to you. Always. Always about yeah. you. Yeah. He said, you've been working now six years. I, I quit school when I was 19. I'm now, I'm now 25. That's six years. He said, you've been working now six years. How are you doing? And I said, not very well. He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. <laughs> He said, would you like to repeat the next six years like the last six? And I says, not really. He said, would you like to revolutionize the next six years versus the last six? And I said, yes. And over the next six-year period, I became a millionaire. You say... Isn't to, that amazing? It is. I mean, From the it, first six yeah. to the second six. Same period of time. Same period of time with a whole totally different philosophy. Yeah. Multiple skills, learning to be an entrepreneur, uh, you know, Zig Soul philosophy. If you help enough people get what they want, yeah. you can have everything you want. Understanding all of that. John Kennedy said, don't ask what the country can do for you. That's not how you get rich. Ask, what could I do for my country? Yeah. Starting with my neighbors, starting with my family. Is there some service I could render, some product I could represent? What could I do for the people of the country? Yeah. And if you start thinking about that, entrepreneurially, now you can have some extraordinary life change. And it happened to me over that next six years versus the last six. What a difference. And the difference was not the country. You don't have to leave the country. And the difference was not the economy. The economy that second six years of my working life was about the same as it was the first six years. So the difference was not, and the difference was not circumstances. You know, some winters are long and some are short. You know, that's going to happen yeah. in any six-year period. But uh, the difference now is your own refined philosophy hmm. and how you think about things. That's why you've got to welcome every chance to listen to the lyrics of a song um, or uh, the sermon on Sunday morning, the teacher, the professor, uh, someone who, like you, recommends good ideas to someone who will take the time to listen. That is all so valuable. And uh, collected over a period of time, compounded into activity and disciplines, uh, fortunes can uh, come your way. Yeah. You and your friend Charlie Jones talk an awful lot about books, mm. and that we become the product of the books mm. we read and the people we meet, audio programs we listen to. What books have shaped your life the most? You know, it started with the Bible. My parents made sure I was a pretty good scholar by the time I was 19. That's 66 books. Now, that's not very politically correct to no, say no. that the Bible. 
right? So, but that's but it's a collection of sixty six yeah. books. You know, whatever you might think about it. Yeah, uh, it, it's had such excellent recommendation over such a long period of time that it's not a bad idea to at least have a look. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to agree, but it would be, I think, not wise not. It would be unwise not to look. At least check it out. What are your because, What are your favorite thoughts from the Bible? One I'm using currently, which I think is so valid, is the paraphrasing it. The storyteller says there were two nice people. The story of two nice people. Not an evil person and a good person, but two nice people. And the storyteller goes on to say, however, and this is where the drama of life begins. However, one built his house on the rock and the other built his house on the sand. And in just one sentence, we, we understand, we comprehend. Well, yes, no matter how nice you are, if you build your house on the sand, come on. Then it says the storms came as they always do. And everybody says, well, yes, we got to recognize that. And the one that built his house on the rock was saved. And the one that built his house on the sand was lost. Both nice people. Which means nice people can make errors in judgment. Nice people can make careless decisions. Nice people can make foolish decisions. Sometimes even fatal. Here's a nice guy. He's married, got a wonderful family. He lives in Los Angeles. He's a good citizen of the community. This is a nice guy. He's ambitious. He does well. He's in Los Angeles driving his car and he's late for an appointment and he's pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. And he comes to the intersection and the light turns red and a little voice in his head says, go ahead, you're late, you can make it. And now he's dead. Nice guy, but he's dead when in a split second of time, he made a foolish decision. So you don't have to go off to some foreign country and die in some foreign war uh, to be dead. All you have to do is make a careless decision or a foolish decision at the wrong time. And we're all tempted. What was that voice I heard this morning that said, you don't have to do your exercises this morning. You hear that voice too? Yeah, you're running I late. I hear that voice too. You can make up for it, you know, when you get right. back from your seminar trip. And I said, no, I've got to do at least a modified version, even though I'm late. And you just, you know, that's every day, Chris. The waitress irritates you. And now you've got a choice. Let it go or make a big deal out of it and embarrass everybody. Everybody's got the choice. Mm -hmm. Here's a good one. I'm walking into Nate and Al's in Beverly Hills, where, by the way, uh, two mornings ago, there was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I had a nice chat with him. Hmm. Um, I walk, uh, before I walk into the restaurant, I, I've got two quarters to put into the machine to get my paper. A man walks up just ahead of me, puts in two quarters, opens it up, takes out his paper, and he holds the door of the dispenser open and says to me, go ahead and take you a copy. Said, you know, the newspaper can certainly afford it. And he offered for me to take my right. new newspaper for free. What do you do? Yeah. Here's a nice person. I got a judgment call to make, fortunately, maybe because I, mama was watching. I don't know. <laughs> no, my upbringing. I said, no, thank you. And he looks very shocked. I said, okay, closed the door. And I put in my two quarters and got my paper. Because the key is, if you take the free paper, it could affect you for the rest of the day. Mm. Something will sort of nag at you and say, why would you want to feel like this to save two quarters? Right. And sometimes when you do it, now that's a good lesson and you won't do it anymore because yeah, you sure. just don't want to feel that way yeah. anymore. That, that means 
maybe part of that's how you've been raised, right? Those little moral questions that you you go through. And guilt can be a good teacher. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> you you don't want to hear at from you say, well, yeah. I don't want to feel like this. And maybe it nags at you for a whole week and you say, wow, for two lousy yeah. quarters, yeah. I took me the free newspaper, never again. And uh, But sure enough, uh, you know, the next time we're tempted again, it doesn't mean that the temptation goes away. We get a little bit stronger about, you know, saying yes to the positive side. Yeah. I, because that's the way I really want to live my life. After the Bible, what uh, what other books would you recommend for people to pick up that shaped and influenced your life? You know, I'm big on Shakespeare and oh. um, Think and Grow Rich changed my life. Um, the Richest Man in Babylon helped me become a millionaire by the time I was 31. Um, then all of the... I'm a big student of history. Durant... Will and Ariel Durant wrote all these books on history. I go through some of those. One book I've got that helped uh, lay the foundation for my own library was a book called How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler. Mortimer Adler, yeah. And in this book, he's got a list of what he considers, you know, the best books ever written. Yeah. And I use that as sort of a centerpiece for my for my library. Yeah. Did you ever meet David Schwartz, uh, Magic of Thinking Big? No. Never met him. That's a good book. Yeah, 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 terrific book. Yeah. Huh. And then there's a book that years ago when I was in my late 20s, um, As a Man Thinketh by James Allen, yeah. where each sentence is almost like a whole seminar. Short in little book. Self. Yeah, but uh, dynamic yeah. yeah, in its effect. Become a good reader, I say now in my seminars, right? Mm. The books you don't read won't help. <laughs> Uh, two books a week in a 10-year period, and you've read a, read a 1,000 books. Wow. And if over the next 10 years you read a 1,000 books, it will dramatically affect every phase and part of your life. Yeah. You talk about uh, the two pains. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to experience one of two pains. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, it – it's one of my favorites that you talk about because it's so profound and it's so true and it's so final. Mm. It is it is universal. It, you will experience one of the two pains. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the little illustration about the newspaper is a good illustration. Um, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. Uh, go for the discipline because it weighs ounces. Uh, the regret weighs tons mm -hmm. because it can accumulate. Mm -hmm. Discipline versus regret. Um, the discipline could be painful, uh, but the regret is usually an accumulation that could eventually become overwhelming. So better the discipline now. But it's true in you know, real life. If you discipline yourself to plant the crop in the spring, you now have a chance for a multiplied harvest in the, in the fall. Um, what you don't plant won't multiply. <laughs> what you neglect. Yeah. I neglected to buy from my friend eight years ago. He offered me this little tiny condo, one bedroom, little small place in Carmel, California. Yeah. Ron said, I want $80,000 for this condo. I said, Ron, that's insane. Uh, nobody's going to pay $80,000 for this condo. He said, okay. If you change your mind, let me know. I'm ready to sell. And uh, he put it on the market last year, toward the end of last year, for $650,000. You know, that was one of those times I should have uh, listened to the positive side of the voice that said, why not buy? And he kept it for another eight years, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, so he's, in his prayers every night before he goes to sleep, he, you know, thanks the good Lord I didn't buy this <laughs> condo. Uh, 80,000 to 650,000. Wow. Um, everything's lessons to learn, right? I could have, I should have. I'll do a better job in the future of making wiser decisions. That, that's the best counsel we can possibly have. Yeah. Um, whether it's, you know, a bit of waste of time that we could tighten up on or whatever it is. Hmm. Uh, why not do it? Then I think one of the greatest joys for me, and of course I've made it now, has become a business, is passing along and, and sharing ideas with others that have 
profoundly affected your own personal life. Hmm. It's a great joy, whether I do it in uh, Nova Siberia, Siberia, or whether I do it in South Africa, or India, or anywhere in the world. Um, the opportunity that if you say something uniquely enough that it could affect somebody's life or begin the process of affecting somebody's life, it, it's an awesome experience. Yeah. You have a, a list of things that people should do. Everybody should, uh, what is it, have a Manhattan in Manhattan. And, uh, oh, yeah, those what, life experiences. Those are, those are fun. Yeah. What are some of those experiences you think everybody should do? Drink a Manhattan in Manhattan. Yeah. <laughs> you should have Australian lobster tails in Australia. Yeah. You should eat uh, Boston baked beans in Boston. Boston. Maui onions are delicious, but you have to eat Maui onions in Maui. It's a lot better than the Walla Walla onions. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'd rather eat onions. If you have true, to eat true. onions, Maui better than Walla Walla. It's a, it's a fun list to make. Yeah. 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 you got to drink Canada Dry in Canada. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, you, if you think long enough, you can come up with a pretty good list of yeah. saying, hey, that sounds like experiences that I'd like to have. How are you spending your time? Got to have a Singapore sling in yep, Singapore. Singapore, yep. yeah, yeah. I just I, I was there just uh, three or four months ago. Singapore, yeah. <laughs> it's a fun list, and it's just check them off. Yeah. But then I talked about you know you got to drink in an Arizona sunset, and yeah. you know walk the white beaches of Carmel, and you know just start making this list. Let it inspire you. Yeah. Um, I started teaching this a long time ago. And it's surprising how many people come up to me and say, you know, I've added to my list. I'm working on the list, you know, 20 years ago when I heard you say this. Here are some of the places I've gone. I probably never would have gone if I hadn't have heard your seminar. That's, that's exciting. Yeah. yeah. How oh, you, you got to have an Idaho baked potato in Idaho. Yeah. You're spending a little you bit of time You can have one in, in Beverly Idaho, Hills and it's okay. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. make the trip. Yeah. Just to say, you know, I had an Idaho baked potato in Idaho. Yeah. So how are you spending your time now when you're not traveling? You, uh... Well, I used to ride the Jeep trails on my dirt bike. But my daughter finally persuaded me. <laughs> Daddy, she said, you know, age 75, I'm not so sure. So uh, that's sort of passing away. But I used to love to do that. Yeah. It was one of my getaway times, you know, up on top of the mountains riding the Jeep trails. And, and uh, either alone or with somebody and... And uh, good, good way to get away. Yeah. No traffic. No traffic lights. Uh, time alone, I think, is is really essential. Sure. Um, to get away, contemplate, think, wonder. Something I'm in, uh, doing now is working on the multi-purpose seventh day. Huh. It says, you know, work six, rest the seventh, but I'm calling the seventh day now multi-purpose. Uh, spirituality and friendship and yeah. getaway and so on. Yeah. But I'm also saying, Chris, that seventh day sh should be a little bit of time spent reviewing the last six days. Huh. Who did I not meet? What didn't I do? What did I miss? What should I tighten up? And then make better plans for the next six days. Huh. I'm going to catch up the next six days, some of this that I've missed the last six so that's part of the multi-purpose of the seventh day, review six. We've called it power living. And let me just give you the list. All of this I'm sure is familiar to you. Maybe I can show it to you in a, in sort of a new way with a, with a new concept, but here's my list. It's a list you can use in, in your training, passing it on to someone else. And here it is. First, self-confidence. Where does self-confidence come from? And this is the best advice I can give you on that. Not neglecting, first of all, the small daily disciplines. Self-confidence really comes from feeling good about yourself. And one of the best ways to feel good about yourself is at the end of the day to know that you poured it on. You did your best. If you conducted a meeting, you did the best you could. If you made a phone call, it was the best phone call you could possibly make. If you wrote a letter, it wasn't a casual letter, it was your best letter. At the end of those kind of days, when you feel good about yourself, self-confidence starts to rise. 
you know that if you can have this kind of a good day, you can have another one the next day, and those days become the weeks, the weeks become the months, and the month becomes a powerful year. Self-confidence comes from the lack of neglect. If you will not neglect to do the small daily disciplines, that's where self-confidence comes from. Part of good health is self-confidence. I know I'm going to be healthy. I take the Herbalife products. I eat the apple a day. I walk around the block. I do the jogging on the beach. At the end of the day, when you've really poured it on and you've done all the stuff, self-confidence grows. That self-confidence affects your health. It affects your future. It affects your psyche. So this is true. One of the great powers is self-confidence. Self-confidence means willingness to do whatever it takes to achieve. Some people say, well, I'll do it for a little while and see what happens. You know, I'll try a couple of things. If that doesn't work, I'm out of here. And all of us know that that kind of person doesn't have much of a future. But if you're willing to do whatever it takes, if I have to learn a couple of things, I will learn those things. If I got to learn five or six things, I'll learn all six. If I have to take an extra class, I'll take an extra class. If I've got to read the books, I'll read the books. If I have to consult with people who know more than I know, I will do the necessary consulting. Whatever it takes, I will do. That starts to develop unbelievable self-confidence. Self-confidence also comes from the ability to rise above your circumstances. Here's the next one, learning the power of purpose. A person who has purpose in their life, they have something to go for, some meaning. One writer described it for some people, it becomes a magnificent obsession. And for you and I, maybe it doesn't need to be that dramatic as a magnificent obsession. But it has to be something that does something to us, something that pulls us, especially into the future. You know, there are many influences on us. One is the influence of the past. Some people are always pulled back, back, back by the past. Some people are always pulled aside by the distractions, the distractions. But here's what's powerful. If you have a list of high purpose in your life, it pulls you toward the future. And the more powerful the purpose is, the stronger it pulls. And here's the other great advantage if you have purpose for the future. It pulls you through all kinds of challenges and all kinds of difficulties. If you don't have these strong purposes for the future, it's easy to get swallowed by a bad day. It's easy to be almost annihilated by a poor month. And it's easy sometimes to almost disappear beneath the waves of a, a year that goes backwards if you don't have something to pull you beyond that year. So if you want something to pull you through all kinds of challenges, all kinds of difficulties and things that come at you, you got to have something on out there beyond today, beyond next week, beyond next month, beyond this year that pulls you into the future. And the clearer it is, the stronger it pulls. The more, the more dynamic it is, the more it affects your life, your spirit, your heart, your soul. It also creates imagination. It gets your mind working on how to achieve that purpose. And if your mind will work, and if your heart works, and if your spirit works, and if you have good input, like good ideas, I'm telling you, there isn't anything you can't accomplish. So that's one of the great powers that'll make a variable of you, and that is purpose. The third on the list I had was is expertise, wanting to excel in all of the skills and settling for nothing less than an outstanding performance. If you're willing to be the best in your field, if you're willing to demand of yourself excellence in skills, to be the best that you can possibly be, in the training, do the best you possibly can. In doing a workshop, do the best you possibly can. Developing the skills of using your personality, developing the skills of language, developing the skills of influence, developing the skills of organizing. If you're willing to be an expert in all of the skills, Herbalife has the way for you to invest those skills and not only make a handsome living, not only make a lot of money, but if you would so desire and if it would be your purpose, a chance to make your fortune. Expertise, excellence in skills. Here was the next one on my list. 
making a powerful contribution to you, the variable, and that is preparation. Well prepared. And preparation, of course, involves a whole lot of things. A big share of our life is preparing, getting ready. When we go to the first grade in school, we're just preparing for the second grade. After we've finished two grades, the two grades prepare us for number three. Sometimes it seems like a long, excruciating time. And the time will just seem like it'll never come when we can finally have the performance that we really want. But it takes time to prepare. It takes time to get ready. And the decisions you make in the preparation time, those are the decisions that last for a lifetime. Preparing to have a good day. It's that preparing, maybe the night before, maybe the couple of days before the day that you're going to put everything together. The preparation for a meeting means that you've taken it serious. The preparation for doing a workshop means you're serious about the workshop. You want to make the best contribution. That kind of preparation is important. But here's preparation that's very vital, and that is to prepare yourself for success. Life seemingly does not wish to waste success on the unprepared. Life says, why waste a fortune on this person? They're not prepared to do the right things with it. They're not prepared to use it wisely. If a fortune was bestowed upon this unprepared person, it would probably be wasted. The people that could have been touched won't be touched. What could have been done won't be done because this fortune will have been wasted on the unprepared person. So not only look for fortune, not only look for the promise, but prepare yourself and ask of yourself, what can I do to make myself ready? Because remember, life was designed not to give us what we want, not to give us what we need, but life was designed to give us what we deserve. Next on my list to help you become the powerful variable was enthusiasm. And here's what I wrote about enthusiasm. Enthusiasm that's powerful is mostly enthusiasm that is enthusiasm inside, 90%, 10% outside. We all know what the enthusiasm is like when somebody lets us see their enthusiasm, which is the, like the 90% and only 10% of it is inside. But the enthusiasm that really affects people is not just being loud, but the enthusiasm that runs deep, the enthusiasm that comes from deep inside, created by self-confidence, created by purpose, created by genuine willingness to help other people, that kind of enthusiasm, knowing that you're going to get the job done, knowing you're going to affect people, knowing you're going to have testimonials flowing in from all kinds of uh, directions, that kind of enthusiasm, a lot of it is quiet, a lot of it is unheard. And the 10% that's heard, it rings a bell. People call it genuine enthusiasm because they know that what you say in the outward display of your enthusiasm is only a small tip of the iceberg of the enthusiasm you feel inside that really motivates you to do the best job you can. Every value in life must be paid for. And those that pay are the ones that get it. It says those that give receive. Someone says, I wish to receive, I wish to receive. You don't have to concentrate on receiving. Just become a good giver. It says those that search will find. Someone says, well, I need to find some good ideas to help change my life for the future. Then to find good ideas, that doesn't come because you need them. It's because it comes because you search for them. If you want good ideas, you've got to go after them. You've got to go to the class. You've got to go to the workshop. You've got to go to the training. Go to the book, right? You've got to go to the journal. Right? Go where good ideas are being taught. Go searching, go looking, because good ideas are not going to be wasted on those that are not seeking, searching, well prepared. So prepare yourself to be ready for fortune when it comes, to be ready for challenge when it comes, to be ready for opportunity when it comes. Opportunity comes along and passes by the person that is not well prepared. I want to prepare myself this year for next year. Yes, I wish to be effective this year, but I'm also thinking of ways. How could I be better? How could my ideas be more powerful? How could they be sharper, more clear? How could I reach some people uh, next year that I perhaps can't reach this year? I haven't reached deep enough into my own soul to affect some people. 
Some people just pass by and say, hey, what a good speech. But how could I make it stronger than that, deeper than that, more powerful than that? Now here's the next one. There's great power in self-reliance. Self-reliance means you simply look mostly to yourself. It would be nice if someone just gave you this, gave you this, gave you this. It would be nice if everyone did their job exactly as they're supposed to do it. But here's what you've got to do. Primarily rely on yourself. Primarily say, I'm the person responsible. And I will learn the necessary skills so that I can help people learn their skills. If I need lots of people to do certain things to build my organization, that is what I must have. But I've got to be the final backstop. I've got to be the final one that people can rely on. So that if this is missed and this is missed, I can catch up. I can fill the gap. I can do the job. We have to do it when we conduct meetings. We have to do it when we conduct training. We have to do it when we're in a class of just a few. What someone might have missed, we're there to fill in. Self-reliance. Primarily, we're learning to count on yourself. So that you can do this, never complain and never explain. Here's the next key power, and that's image. There's many parts to image. The image that others see you as, the image you have with other people. And it's very important how other people see you. If they don't see you as a leader, chances are they won't pay attention. If they don't see you as being in control, chances are they won't have the trust. If they don't see you as knowing where you're going, what you want to accomplish, they probably won't follow. But if people can see you, if you have the image of someone that's in charge, in control, in control of your life, your future, your destiny, in control of the situation, if they see that, that kind of image is powerful. It helps to win the day. It attracts other people. People want to be around people that are in control that are powerful, but they know how to use their power. Influential, but they know how to use their influence. That kind of image is important. But here's a very important image, and that is your image of yourself. The way you dress, the way you talk, the way you think, your capacity for learning. All of that is an important image that you have of yourself. The image that you have that if it needs to be learned, you could learn it. If there's a book that needs to be mastered, you could master it. If there's a skill that needs to be learned, why couldn't you get busy now and learn that skill? That kind of self-image that I am continually trying my best to be the best I can. Because one of the most important places you have to look is into the future, yes. You've got to look into the past, yes. You've got to look around, yes. But one of the most important places you have to look is in the mirror. You know, how I appear to other people, that's important. But how I appear to myself is the ultimate importance. That kind of image to where you'll develop the self-confidence, you'll develop the self-reliance. Now here's another one in my rather short list. The next word is character. Becoming a person of high values a person of principles, a person of honesty, a person that earns respect, that kind of character. You know, cash it out as quickly as possible and leave. Mark was involved when others took advantage of him all those years ago before Herbalife. When someone took advantage, didn't have the character, didn't have the principles, and didn't have the... Uh, the character to stay, the character to see it through, the character to do the right thing. So this is important to develop the character within yourself that people see you as honest, as fair, willing to do the right thing, willing to be helpful, but always willing to walk the center line, not to pass the line. When we come to an opportunity like Herbalife, especially uh, multi-level network marketing, it is so dynamic, it is so powerful, and it is so possible in fortune-making that sometimes people want to speed up the process by cutting the corners, by neglecting to do the right things, 
you know, to cheat a little here, cheat a little here, you know, cross the line just a little bit because then, you know, it'll grow faster and you can cash in quicker. Not necessary here. Doing Herbalife right will build your fortune longer and stronger than trying to cut the corners and not doing it right. If, you'll ha- if we'll have the integrity that Mark had when he started it and keep perpetuating that, that we will do the right thing by the marketing system, the right thing by uh, a distributor who has a customer and they take care of that customer, that customer belongs to that distributor, that kind of integrity in the marketing system, the kind of integrity we have among each other, the kind of character we have to rely on each other, because here's we, what we cannot do. We cannot do this by ourselves. Now here's another one. It's called self-discipline. Self-discipline, all of us have a challenge with that. Because sometimes it's easy, and especially if you're working hard, doing the best you can, it's easy sometimes to let up and let it go. But remember, so many people, especially now that we're as big as we are around the world, are counting on what we do. At home office, they have to be careful. They have to be disciplined. It's easy for the person who ships the product from Herbalife, says, oh, well, I'll wait until tomorrow to ship it. And then they go home and sleep like a baby. But the distributor who's waiting for that product doesn't sleep that night or doesn't sleep when the product doesn't show on time. But if everybody will have the discipline to say, I will do the best job I can, I will make mistakes, of course, because we're all human, but I'll try to remedy those mistakes and do the best job I can. That kind of self-discipline that understands how important your part is in all of the functions that work. Coming to work on the set here, uh, HBN, there's so many people that play a part. And each one of the parts that are played is necessary to put on the broadcast, make it viable, make it real, make it powerful. Any couple of them missing, and it would be a disaster. But all of it put together, and it works like a charm. Each person developing the self discipline to do their part do their job here's one more and that is the power of extraordinary performance and demanding of yourself excellent results if we would ask of ourselves that kind of performance and you've got to ask it of yourself you know I can't ask it of you I would try to inspire you I would try my best to share with you what it might taste like, what it's like to finally make your fortune. It happened for me. But here's what you must do. You must demand it of yourself. Society does not demand that you not have a heart attack. But if you want to escape having a heart attack, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you take herbal life and improve your health. You have to demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you jog around the block every morning. But if you want good health, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you read a couple of books a week and improve your intelligence and your knowledge. That you must demand of yourself. Society does not demand that you build a financial wall around your family nothing can get through. That's not a demand of society. But you must demand it, if you wish it, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you learn a list of 10 skills in order to ensure your own future and the future of your family. Society doesn't demand it, doesn't require it. It is not a law. But if you want the benefit, you must demand it of yourself. To remember to be mindful of the seasons. I've got a little topic now called the four major lessons in life to learn. I've done this some time in the past, but it's been a while. And for all of you that are brand new, I'd like to have you pick up on what I'm about to share with you right now. I think it's going to be valuable. It's going to be important. So jot this phrase down. Life and business is like the changing seasons. This is some of the most valuable information I got when I was a young man. Just starting out. Life and business is like the seasons. And then here's the next phrase. You cannot change the seasons. That's impossible. You can't rearrange the seasons. You cannot say, well, I'll take five harvest times, no winters, a few springs, and a summer or two. You can't rearrange them. 
The seasons are going to come however they're going to come, and you cannot change that. So you cannot change the seasons. But make this note, you can change yourself. That was the message I got when I was 25 years old with someone who took the time to teach me. You can change yourself. And by the way, only human beings have this extraordinary ability to make dramatic changes in their life. All of the life forms except human beings are driven by instinct and the genetic code. In America, the goose can only fly south in the winter. And why does the goose have to fly south in the winter in America? Because he's a goose. He can't fly any other direction. But that's not true with human beings. Human beings can go north. They can go south. They can go east. They can go west. Human beings can live one way for five years and then tear up that script and live a totally different way the next five years. Humans can do that. I'm asking you to utilize your power as a human being and change your life to whatever degree you want it changed. If you want your income to change, I'm telling you it's within your power. With Herbalife's marketing and these explosive, incredible products, you can do that. Any year you choose, you can make incredible changes in your life. You're not a tree, you don't have to stay. You're not a goose, you don't have to fly south. I'm telling you, anytime you want to, you can say, I'm going to change my attitude, I'm going to change my income, I'm going to change my abilities, I'm going to do more than I've ever done before. Take on that as your God-given right as a human being to change your life to whatever degree you want it to change. As I've watched Mark these last 17 years, I'm telling you Mark was one of those that took up the challenge, being a human being, to drastically change his life. These years, since he was about 20, from the last 20 years before, he put together the Herbalife products. What a change, what a transformation. And if Mark can do it, you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. If the president's team members have done it, there isn't anybody in here that can't do it. Dramatically change the course and the quality of your life. So learn the value of the seasons now. You can't change them, but you can change yourself. Now here's the four major lessons in life to learn. Number one, learn how to handle the winters. It's a fact of life. The winters follow the fall, the harvest. And pray tell how often, 6,000 years that we know of recorded history, winter comes after fall, night comes after day, difficulty follows opportunity, recession always comes after expansion. It's been the rhythm of life for the last 6,000 years of recorded history. Now there's all kinds of winters. There's the winter of the season, but there's all kinds of other winters. There's political winters. What a winter that was when the Nazis marched into Prague. What a winter it was when the communists put up the Iron Curtain. What a winter it was when Stalin finally took power in Russia. What a winter it was when Benito Mussolini took power in Italy. What a winter it was in Japan. What a winter it was in many parts of the world back during World War II, one of the longest winters, political winters in recorded history. So the winters are going to come. The winter of sickness, the winter of disappointment, the winter of devastation, social winters, economic winters, personal winters when your heart is smashed in a thousand pieces and the nights are unusually long. It's simply called winter time. But the winters are inevitable. So it has been for the last six and a half thousand years recorded history. You say, well, Mr. Rohn, what can I do about the winters of life? In World War II, we marched against the winter and finally the spring came. We marched against the tyranny of communism and finally the walls came tumbling down. We marched against the tyranny of the Nazis and finally liberated the world for democracy and freedom. And that's what I'm telling you. It's possible for you to conquer your winters.
And some are small little winters when you get your first refund. A little small winter. When you show up, someone said, right, they put together the meeting, got everything ready, ready to show the story, ready to do the meeting, and nobody showed up. It's called a little piece of winter time. But anyway, that's going to come. The winter of a divorce, the winter of a death in the family, the winter of a tragedy, some things we can't understand. But here's what we do know. It's possible for us to get through the winter. Here's what's exciting about the passing of time. It takes you through whatever you're experiencing at the moment. That's what time will do, take you through the winter. Now, how do you handle the winters? Make this little note. You can get better and you can get stronger and you can get wiser. There's no winter that you can't overcome. There's no winter that you can't figure out how to survive. There's no winter powerful enough that you cannot, with the ingenuity of being a human being, especially with the Herbalife opportunity, of figuring out a way to get through it. Hang on. Make this note. Winters don't last forever. Yes, the tyranny of the Nazis lasted for about five years, but it was soon over. Yes, the tyranny of communism lasted for 75 years, but finally that long winter was passed. So become wiser, become stronger, become better to handle the winters that are going to come in your life. And with the strength of the Herbalife family, with the strength of the training, with the strength of these incredible products, with self-esteem bursting out all over, with the skills you're going to develop, you're going to be able to handle whatever comes your way. I promise you that. Now here's the next season. It's called the season of spring. And make this note, if you haven't made it in your head already, make it in your notes. Spring always comes. Sometimes the winter seems long. The night seems like it'll never pass, but sure enough, eventually, the night has to give way to the day. Winter has to give way to the spring. The difficult time has to give way to opportunity. The recession has to give way, finally, to the progression, to the expansion. And I don't know what kind of winters you've been through, but I want you to know when the Herbalife story reached your ears, when the Herbalife marketing reached your consciousness, and when this opportunity was passed along to you, I know that for a lot of you, it was called springtime has arrived. The long night has passed and opportunity is here. Spring always comes. Just hang in there when the night is long. Hang in there when it's dark. Hang in there when you can't figure it out. And your spring will surely come. Now here's what you must learn to do. Jot this note down. Take advantage of the spring. Just because spring comes is no sign you're going to look good in the harvest. You must do something with it. You must seize that moment. It is true that the dark time doesn't last forever, but here's what you've got to also understand. Spring doesn't last forever. In space language, we call it a window of opportunity. When they get ready to blast off, the rocket's headed for the moon, whatever. There's a certain period of time. That's the time you've got to go. If you don't go then, you've got to wait for another whole cycle to turn. Springtime is here called Herbal Life for you. I'm asking you to take advantage of it. Tell the story. Pass out the literature. Make the calls. Conduct the meetings. See the people. Grab and seize this opportunity like you've never seized anything in your life before to make something remarkable of it. This Herbalife opportunity is called spring time. Take advantage. Don't be lazy, especially in the spring. Don't be distracted, especially in the spring. What if you asked a farmer to go bowling in the spring? He would think you were insane. The farmer would say you can go bowling in the winter. You can go bowling after the crop is in. But you certainly can't go bowling in the spring. 
And I want you to know after this extravaganza, an extraordinary new spring is upon us. If there was ever a time when you get back home, this is the time to massively increase your numbers. Get up a little earlier, stay up a little later, pour it on, take advantage of this spring that's here. Now here's my next point. You've got to take advantage of every spring that comes because there's only a handful. Life isn't forever. It finally comes to an end. One of the Beatles wrote, all things must pass. The sunrise doesn't last all day. Spring doesn't last all summer. The sunset doesn't last all night. We all have periods of time, periods of time, pieces of time. And when those pieces of time comes, what you've got to do is take advantage of each time that comes. At the longest, life is brief. At the longest, life is just a small period of time. So don't waste your springs. Don't waste the opportunity to talk to someone. Don't waste the opportunity to have a meeting. Don't waste the opportunity to come to next extravaganza. Don't waste the chance. Each spring that comes, take advantage of them because there's just a few. Don't let them all pass. Take advantage. Now here's number three. In the course of the seasons, one is the winter, two is the spring, three is the summer. The summer is called challenging time. In the summer, we've got two things going for us. One is opportunity, but the other is to watch out for your enemies. Nourish your values in the spring, in the summer. Like a mother, nourish the values. Distributors you've got, make sure that they, give, that they get plenty of nourishment from you, plenty of training from you, plenty of understanding from you. Don't be short, don't be careless. Give them your best like a mother would give the best to her child. Give them the best you've got. Just because they're not part of your immediate family, they're a part of your Herbalife family, they deserve the best nourishment you've got. Don't shortchange them on food that'll help them to grow. Don't shortchange them on information that will help them to learn. Don't shortchange them on ideas that'll help them to transform their lives. Be like a mother in the summer and give the best you've got to everybody you can reach and everybody you can touch. It's called opportunity in the making. Be careful of those around you. Even when your check comes from Herbalife, you say, well, Herbalife sends my check. Well, here's what you've got to understand. It's not the 13th floor that sends you your check. It's not the computer that sends you your check. Some live human being had to make it possible for that money to finally get to you. So remember, it's human beings that make our lives valuable. It's not systems, it's not numbers in the marketing, it's not computers, it's not the printout, it's not points and it's not royalties. What makes us all rich beyond our wildest imagination is people. So be mindful of investing in the summer in every person you can possibly invest in. They will make you wealthy. Now here's what else you must do in the summer. Like a father, you must look out for your enemies. And believe me, we're going to have some. In the political world during our lifetime, there's been many enemies of freedom, enemies of democracy, enemies of free enterprise. It wasn't that many years ago that it was illegal to make a profit in the communist countries. It wasn't that long ago until democracy was not flourishing like it is today. In America, you know, we've had 200 years of freedom and democracy and free enterprise for the last 200 years. But some have not been so fortunate. Some have not been so lucky. Let us learn to appreciate it when it does come our way. But there's going to be political enemies. There's going to be social enemies. There's going to be people that will be envious of herbal life. And they will not be your friends. But remember, like a father who would guard carefully his family, I'm asking you to stand guard over the family called Herbal Life. I'm asking you to stand at the door. 
I'm asking you, whatever threatens you, threaten it back. Whatever pushes against you, push it back. Whatever wants to overwhelm you like a father, stand up, take control, and do battle with your enemies wherever you find them. Now here's one more. We must also deal with the enemies within ourselves. Yes, we've got enemies on the outside. Saddam Hussein takes over Kuwait. We have to put together half a million troops, go kick him out of Kuwait so that liberty will continue to flourish. But some of the enemies are not way off in some distant country. Some of the enemies are not personified in the Hitlers of the world and the Stalins of the world. Some of the enemies are a lot closer than that. They are within. And I want to give you a list of some of the things to watch out for when you get back home called enemies within yourself. Here's the first one, indifference. Whatever you do, practice not being casual. You've got to shake off sometimes the lethargy. They would say, oh, well, maybe it's not going to work for me. Or I'll just go along and see what happens. I'm asking you, whatever you do, the intensity that you've gathered up here during this extravaganza, I want you to take this same intensity home with you. <coughs> Don't be casual. Casualness creates casualties. Whether it's in herbal life or whether it's on the freeway. Go home with a renewed intensity. Don't let indifference take over. Here's the next one. Indecision. Someone's mentioned it a couple of times on this stage. They've had to deal with it. You've got to deal with it. Indecision is called the thief of opportunity. Make decisions even if it's a wrong decision. Do the very best you can. Make a decision and go with it. If it doesn't work out because it was a wrong decision, I'm telling you, that gives you experience now to make a better decision. Here's the next one, doubt. We've all got to deal with the enemy of doubt. Cynicism has a unique way of crowding in on all of us. Being cynical about the government, being cynical about banks and money, being cynical about society, being cynical about the past, cynical about the future. I'm asking you, don't let that disease grab you by the throat and ruin your chances to do well in herbal life. Yes, it's easy to doubt that it can happen. It's easy to doubt. We've all got fears that want to crowd in. And here's one of the worst ones of all, and that is to doubt yourself. I know we look at Mark, glamorous, handsome, good looking, extremely successful. Say, my gosh, I don't think that could happen for me. But I want you to know that Mark says, and I say to you, that if it can happen to us, it can happen to anybody in this room. Don't doubt your own ability. <clears throat> Don't doubt your own strength. If Mark can make it through some tough times, you can make it through. If Mark went through some strenuous times, you can go through those strenuous times. When the nights were long for Mark, I'm telling you, he made it, he made it, you can make it. If I can make it, you can make it. If these people in the president's team can carve out an extraordinary story, second to none, in the business community of the world, I'm telling you, from these tables, this success can go right on back to the millionaire team and the get team and to everybody up there wherever you're sitting today. All of this belongs to all of you. Don't doubt that, not for a minute. <laughs> Next is worry. I mean, you know, you gotta worry some, but here's the clue, don't let it conquer you. If it's two o'clock in the morning and your daughter's not home, yes, you've got to worry. If you're in New York City and step off the curb and one of those yellow taxis is coming, yes, you better worry. But mark this down, let worry alarm you, but don't let it conquer you. We all need to be concerned. We all need to be concerned. 
If there's enemies around, we need to be concerned. If it isn't going well, yes, we need to be concerned. But I'm asking you to let it concern, let it touch you, let it alarm you, but don't let it conquer you. Take all of the worries you've got and try to drive them into the smallest corner you can possibly find. If you don't, worry will be like a mad dog loose in the house. It'll have you in the corner. So whatever your enemies are here, drive them into a small corner. Here's the next one. Over caution. Hey, in the spring, if you're too cautious, you never will plant the seed. If you're too cautious, you won't take the chance. If you're too cautious, you won't step out front. If you're so cautious, you probably never would have done your first meeting. Make this note. You got to take a chance. Drive your tendency to be too cautious. Drive it into a small corner. Yes, you can't be gullible. No, you can't go for everything. Yes, you've got to be careful. Yes, but don't be so cautious that it paralyzes you. Don't be so cautious that it restricts your chance to do better. See if you can't conquer that. Here's the next one, pessimism. Yes, there's the dark side. Yes, there's the problem side. Yes, there's the difficult side. But I'm telling you, it's not the only side. Yes, the glass is half empty, but it's also half full. Yes, there's the dark side, but there's the light side. Yes, the night comes, but so does the day. I'm telling you, don't be afraid of both sides, opportunity and difficulty, chance and danger. Learn how to handle it all. Now here's the last one. When you get back home, you've got to deal with it. I have to deal with it. We all have to deal with it. And that's complaining. Yes, there's room for a legitimate complaint. Yes, there's room for a legitimate business complaint. Yes, there's room for a legitimate complaint with the 13th floor. Yes, there's room for a legitimate complaint with the warehouse. Yes, there's room for a legitimate complaint once in a while with each other. But here's what I'm asking you. Don't let complaining master your life. If you become a chronic complainer, I'm telling you, Nobody wants to be around you, chronic complainer. I wouldn't want you for a business partner. Don't let complaining conquer your life. See if you can't drive it into a small corner. That's the season of summer. Nourish your values like a mother and fight your enemies like a father. Even if you have to fight the enemies that are within yourself. Make this note. Don't become a victim of yourself. It's possible to become a victim of tragedy. It's possible to become a victim of gossip. It's possible to become a victim of the things that happen out there. But here's the most important thing. Don't become a victim of yourself. Forget the thief in the alley that's after your purse. What about the thief in your mind that's after your promise? The thief in your mind that says you're too short. The thief in your mind that says you're too tall. The thief in your mind that says, well, yes, it'll happen to people out in California, but it can't happen way over here on this side of the world. I'm asking you to conquer that thief, even though you find him in your own consciousness. I want to reassure you that you can do it. I want you to reassure you that you can make the decisions. I want to reassure you that no matter what the night, no matter what the storm, no matter what the difficulty, there isn't anybody here that can't figure it out Find some things to do, step at a time, yes. Minute at a time, yes. Day at a time, yes. Week at a time, yes. But there isn't anything you can't walk away from. There isn't any challenge you can't overcome. I want you to have that kind of belief in yourself. Now here's the last season. Now here's the last season. It's called the season of harvest. After the long summer that we've been faithful, we've been disciplined, we've nourished our values like a mother, we fought our enemies like a father. Then, as one writer said of ancient script, in due time, your harvest will come.
And I want to give you that promise today one more time. I want to remind you of the seasons. I want to remind you of the testimonials you've already heard on this stage. Those that have already gotten the diamonds, they've got the cufflinks, they've got the earrings, those that have got the rewards, and some of those extraordinary rewards are going to be passed out on this stage here this evening. And that's going to be exciting to watch. Julio is going to be here. He's going to be fun to watch. Mark's been here. Nothing much more exciting than to watch Mark take charge, watch Mark enjoy the proceeds of all that he's created in the last 15 years. It's exciting to watch the president's team and be excited. And I'm going to be happy to watch all of what unfolds here. But I'm also happy about watching myself. I can't believe where I am today. I can't believe what's happened to me. But sure enough, their rewards came, Mark's rewards came, and so did mine. And I want you to have that same opinion. Your day will come. Your harvest is sure. It'll be there for you. Herbalife will be here to reward you every step of the way. Whatever small steps of progress you have to take, take them. Herbalife will be here to reward you. And when you finally walk across the stage like this, this evening, it will be a thrill beyond imagination. And then you'll be able to say, by gosh, the hard work has paid off. The lonely nights have paid off. Working hard every day has paid off. And my harvest has finally come. Now, a couple of things I want you to think about now in the harvest time. Here it is. Accept your personal harvest with full responsibility. No need to complain because it's your crop. If Herbalife does its best, Herbalife produces the finest products and the finest marketing, the support system second to none. I've never seen the likes of a support system like Herbalife. If all of that's been provided for you, I'm telling you the rest is up to you. So whatever your harvest is, you've got to say, that's my harvest. Don't complain. Take responsibility. Now here's the next one. Don't apologize. When you walk home with the rewards that you're going to be receiving here, especially you and the president's team, chairman's club, millionaire team, get team, you that have been especially honored, by having these seats of honor here and this extravaganza, I want you to go home prouder than you've ever been before. And here's what I want you to say when you get home. I deserve the honor. I got it, but I deserved it. They don't pass out diamonds for non-work. We don't pass out diamonds for those that are just related to us. We don't pass out these extraordinary rewards and give honor to those who don't do the job. Those who do the work get the pay, and those that do the work get the honors. And I'm proud of all of you here today. On more than one occasion, I've heard Mark say, I'm proud of what I do. He's around a lot of top executives now around the world, and some of them aren't that proud of how they earn their money. But every dollar that Mark earns, every fortune and piece of fortune that he makes stacked on top of the other, I'm telling you, Mark says, I look myself in the mirror and say, I'm darn proud of the success I've got because of the ser service I've rendered to the people. And you can likewise be proud.